Welcome to day two of Biodiversity Without Boundaries. I'm really excited to be here in Florida with John Odding, the Chief of Conservation Services at the Florida Natural Areas Inventory. We've just come back from a couple of, from a great day in the field yesterday. Um, before we talk about that, I want to make sure that I thank our sponsors, uh, the Virginia Department of Conservation and Recreation, the Virginia Natural Heritage Program, NatureServe Canada, the Sustainable Forestry Initiative, Virginia's United Land Trusts, Capital One, ExxonMobil, and the Virginia Native Plant Society. We really appreciate all of your support. We really couldn't host this conference without you and share all this amazing information and technology related to conservation of biodiversity really throughout the world. So thank you for, thanks to all of our sponsors. So I wanna talk a little bit about um, Florida and what we did yesterday. Um, it was amazing, Bald Point State Park. Mm -hmm. tell, tell, the, tell them what we <laughs> did yesterday and yeah. they can be jealous. Well, first of all, thanks Sean for coming down to see us. Um, uh, we really enjoyed hosting the, you this week and showing you a little bit of what Natural Florida has to offer. Um, we had a great day yesterday. The weather was just spectacular. Nice spring weather for North Florida. And uh, yeah, so we spent the morning out at uh, Bald Point State Park on the coast. So we got to see some of the uh, North Florida coastline um, on some land that also has just recently been purchased by the state of Florida for conservation uh, as part of the Florida Forever program. And that's a, a state program that we're really very closely involved with um, as the state's heritage program. Um, a lot of the data that we collect, just like all the other heritage programs around the country, um, feeds into helping them make decisions about the most important places to buy uh, for state lands. Um, and so we got to see one of those places yesterday, Ball Point State Park, um, has uh, sea turtle nesting beaches. It's also got some, uh, a, a really nice landscape connectivity from the coastline inland to um, state and national forests that are further inland in Florida and just a, a nice diversity of natural communities, uplands and wetlands, a whole, whole array of, of rare species there. So that was just a really nice um, look at uh, that coastal Florida. Yeah, and you mentioned Florida Forever, which is mm -hmm. a really great land acquisition program that you all have here in Florida. And as I understand it, your state legislature is about to wrap up and there's some potentially There's potentially some news. really good news this year. Uh, the Florida legislature is finishing their budget this week as we speak. And right now they have written into the budget uh, $400 million for land acquisition through Florida Forever, uh, which is really just fantastic. It's more than we've ever had in a, in a, in a single year. Um, so we hope that stays uh, in the budget to the very end. Um, we're, we're optimistic and really mm -hmm. excited about that. Yeah, great. Uh, and then in the afternoon, we drove over to Wakulla Springs. Yes. Some say is the largest freshwater spring in the world. The, the chief of the park told us that they claim it is one of the largest because there's so many different ways to measure it. But it is a fantastic place and it's a beautiful, highly recommended. Yeah, beautiful spring and river system uh, just south of Tallahassee. And uh, so we got to uh, take a look at, at the natural areas there and then also do an old fashioned boat ride on yes. the river. Uh, got to see some alligators, lots of birds, turtles, other Manatees. wildlife, and a manatee. Uh, so we really got the, uh, the everything you might want to see on the river there yesterday. Yeah. So it really worked out well. It was really, really great <laughs> trip. Yeah. Um, so is there anything else you want to tell us about the Florida Natural Areas Inventory? Um, I think uh, I think that was a good picture of sort of what we're involved in here in Florida. Um, it, we work, of course, we're part of the, the Florida State University here, so we're not in a state agency. We're housed in a university, um, but we have close relationships with uh, all of the state conservation agencies as well as federal, um, and they are very important partners for us, and we work closely with them to advise them on not only land acquisition for new parks, but land management on the lands that they already own and manage. Yeah. And that's really where the rubber meets the road for conservation, and we're able to bring our information, our science, and our expertise to bear um, every day on land management decisions that they're making. Um, and it really is really rewarding work, I mean, to be able to see the kind of science and information that we as a heritage program collect 
see it feeding out to decision makers and onto the ground yeah. um, and getting used. So. Fantastic. Well, I really want to thank you and Frank and um, Carly and Amy and uh, Deborah for a really great trip. This was the fifth stop in the Van Humboldt tour of NatureServe Natural Heritage Programs and Conservation Data Centers. And so it's, it's been great. Uh, next week, we'll be joining uh, BWB from Alabama, which is going to be really exciting. Can't wait to uh, go to see some of the things in Alabama next week. Um, so next up is, like we did yesterday, we're going to show some uh, highlights from across the network from the Natural Heritage Programs. Um, and then after that, uh, we're going to do notes from the field with Dr. Bruce Young, who's the chief zoologist and senior conservation scientist here at NatureServe. Hope you enjoy the rest of the afternoon and uh, look forward to seeing you out on the trails. It is easy to recognize the beauty of Michigan, but to protect it, we need to understand it. As a part of Michigan State University Extension, Michigan Natural Features Inventory delivers information about the state's natural resources to conservation partners. We document populations of rare plants and animals, and we describe our state's special natural community. We focus on the places that capture our imagination. Michigan is a treasure. Follow us as we explore the nature of our identity. Hi, this is Kristen Zabo, Administrator of the Nevada Division of Natural Heritage. I'd like to present a brief update on spring snail surveys conducted over the last year. Spring snails are small, gill-breathing spring obligate gastropods in the genus Pergulopsis, or PERGS for short, found at spring sources and outflows. Spring snails are indicators of biodiversity and spring health. They only occur where there is permanent water, and that's difficult to come by in the driest state in the nation. More than 180 spring snail species have been described in North America, and over 100 taxa have been identified in Nevada, where they tend to be local endemics, often occurring in a single spring source. The Nevada Division of Natural Heritage is a partner in the Bi-State Spring Snail Conservation Team to implement the conservation strategy for spring snails in Nevada and Utah. Despite the limitations during the pandemic, Nevada Natural Heritage surveyed 68 springs last summer and fall, collecting data on spring health, water quality, and spring snail populations. Many spring snail specimens were sent off for genetic testing to confirm their taxonomy and were anxiously awaiting the results. Hello, this is Jason Bullock from Virginia Natural Heritage Program um, 2020. Uh, as we all know, it was quite a challenging year, but it was an extremely successful year at Virginia Natural Heritage, uh, thanks to our staff being so focused and so flexible. Um, so uh, for some highlights, um, our data continue to drive everything we do. Uh, right now, we're managing um, about 10,000 EOs, uh, 2,200 or so conservation sites that are B-ranked in our data set. And these, um, and that's tracking uh, 1,500 species and over 430 natural community types. So these data are driving everything we do from data sharing, environmental review, land protection, and stewardship of, of preserves. Uh, our predictive suitable habitat modeling in the past year, we've continued to expand that beyond t and &E, And we've modeled now uh, predictive suitable habitats for about 50 G1 non-listed species. And we're using these models in our environmental review um, to streamline that. Uh, last year, 2020, we reviewed uh, over 3,100 projects and between 65 and 75% of those month to month are coming in to us through our Natural Heritage Data Explorer. Uh, that's our environmental review tool that actually uh, the idea for NatureServe to develop, host and maintain that for us um, as the first ERT for the network, um, that, idea, that idea came about at the BWB uh, 10 years ago in Nebraska City. Um, so um, we've also just finished a, a, a data set that took us two or three years to, to finish called the Essential Conservation Sites data set. This basically allows us to identify, prioritize those conservation sites that are most critical to protect if we have an ultimate goal 
of protecting every element in Virginia. Um, also in 2020, we completed over a dozen land acquisition projects, which is a, a huge year for land acquisition, adding over 2,500 acres to our natural area preserve system, which is now 65 preserves and over 59,000 acres in total. Two of those preserves added last year were brand new in the system. Uh, one protects a cave, a significant cave with the G1 species, and the other protects uh, G1 Shenandoah Valley sinkhole ponds uh, and a host of other uh, tracked plants and animal species. And lastly, uh, last year was a year like none other for public access on our uh, 20 public access natural area preserves. Um, as local and federal parks and other state park state lands in some cases were closing around us, we worked very hard to keep our preserves open. So the public had that outlet. Um, but it meant seven days a week, staff, time, volunteers, uh, helping to make sure that that public access didn't exceed the capacity of these preserves, which are protected for biodiversity protection uh, primarily. Uh, in three cases, we had to close the preserves uh, temporarily uh, due to a variety of impacts, but um, that allowed us to quickly uh, implement some new measures on the ground that are going to help us moving forward to, to better balance public access with biodiversity protection. Uh, so um, we're looking at an enormous 2021 as well. Um, so we look forward to sharing that as well. But in 2021, we're stronger, we're better, and we're wiser because of 2020. So I want to thank again uh, all the Virginia Natural Heritage staff for hanging in there. Um, and um, thank you to this network who we work with in some capacity every single day, onward and upward. everyone and welcome to this year's edition of Notes from the Field. I'm your host, Bruce Young. In case you're new to BWB, Notes from the Field is an informal whirlwind tour of some of the cool science and conservation work taking place across the network. Think of it like a sampler flight of craft beers at a brewery. There will be a little bit of everything and it's all really good. Today we'll be hearing from 13 states and provinces highlighted on the map here. Now, Indiana was a late addition, and so we put a star there. That's why they're not highlighted. The presenters are listed there on the right. They'll introduce themselves um, as they speak. Uh, um, some of these um, presentations are recorded and some are live. Um, they say we're the tech firm for nature, so we should be able to make this all work. Uh, that is with a little help from our friends here at Digital. As with the other sessions, we'll be recording this one. Um, unfortunately, there won't be time for spoken questions after the presentations, but please type your questions into the chat window and we'll try to get them answered as we go. Please put the name of the speaker you're addressing your question to so we know who should uh, try to answer you. Okay, the show is ready to begin. So buckle your seatbelts, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Hi, my name is Anna Yellen. I'm a wildlife, I'm a wildlife biologist in the wildlife conservation section of Georgia DNR. And I'd like to tell you about a project that I've been working on. So for this episode of Notes from the Field, I'm gonna take you all to South Georgia. This is a coastal plain bog and it is private land that is in a conservation easement. The land is managed by Georgia DNR by cutting the woodies and prescribed burning. And these are just some pictures of a night in the bog. 
So the project began with an inquiry from Lance Durden. He's a local professor and he was interested in the pitcher plant moth. Um, it's a really interesting moth. Instead of being killed by the carnivorous plants in the bog, they actually rely on them. Um, the pitcher plant bog moth is um, in flight around August and September, but we decided instead that we were going to go for a full year and survey the bog. So you might ask, why would somebody be interested in moths? Um, they're kind of drab, they all look alike, they're out at night, but actually there's a huge amount of diversity. Um, you can also ID them in the field and through photos. Um, they're great environmental indicators also, um, but so are a lot of it, other invertebrates. They um, are really good indicators of the community in the bog because the larvae are very specialized to plant species. Um, so we, uh, so, uh, well, oh, the, and the big thing is that the diversity comes to the surveyor, which is really exciting. You don't have to go out and look for anything. These are the procedures that we used. Um, so we didn't trap, unlike a lot of other surveys. We um, just set up some lights and some sheets. We used between two and four sheets, and I did photo documentation. Lance was doing a lot of the identification in the field, and I was taking photos. Um, each time we went out in the field, I took probably about 500 photos, and I tried to get three views of every species that we saw. So I'd take some from the back, I'd take them from the side, and I took a lot of photos. This is a real slide, but all I really wanted to show you all is in summary is that no two databases are in agreement as far as how many moth species are out there. I have up here the Butterflies and Moths of North America and the Moth Photographers Group, which are very specialized and also NatureServe. And what, these, what I was looking at is that one, Georgia is lacking a lot of elements, um, but we're solving that problem. We are accumulating a lot of data and we are also planning to do a bulk load, bulk upload. And you can actually find out information about how to do that bulk upload on the NatureServe website. Um, status of the, of the study. Okay, so we uh, serve, right now we just finished our last month, April, 2021. And we did surveys from 2018 to 2021. We did not survey every month of every year, but we tried to make sure that we had at least once a month for the full period of the study. Um, we had to survey when it was over 60 degrees Fahrenheit, which is very challenging, but in South Georgia, it's not nearly as bad as the other states, obviously. Um, and so noted in the field, well, we were finding lots of new species. There's a huge diversity. I'd say we probably saw, but we probably photographed between 1,000 and 2,000 species. Um, the survey highlights the database needs. But something else that I thought was really interesting to note is this is a great outreach tool. And so now I started taking it around a little bit pre-COVID. Um, and you, those people that are looking at the sheet are some people at a botanical garden that I went to. So we're trying to do some outreach using moths now to tell people about the environment. And now I'm just gonna show you some slides of some of the diversity that we saw. There's a huge diversity of shapes and sizes of the moths, colors of the moths, and that's just a little sampling. And, whoops, this is my contact information. If you'd like to get in contact and hear any more about it, please reach out. Thank you. Hi, I'm Christopher Tracy. I'm the Conservation Planning Manager for the Pennsylvania Natural Heritage Program. And here's some notes from the field from the Yakagani River in southwestern Pennsylvania. We've been partnering with the Nature Conservancy and the Army Corps of Engineers to better understand the hydrology of these river scour habitats. 
These river scours are typically open barrens or grasslands that provide habitat for a number of different species, including some that are globally rare, like Marshallia pulchra. Although flooding creates the habitat that this species needs to survive, too much of it, or flooding during the wrong season, may be causing a decline in its numbers. Place trail cameras at a series of river scour sites down the Yakagani River corridor. These cameras go and record one image every 15 minutes. We take these images, we compress them into a time-lapse video, and then we overlay a hydrograph on top of that video. This gives us a great understanding of how high flow events can affect these river scour habitats in terms of frequency, duration, and other factors such as that. Beyond these time-lapse videos, we have created high-resolution elevation maps from drone imagery. We have used these elevation maps to feed into a hydrologic model developed by the Army Corps of Engineers. From this model, we can now calculate the frequency and duration of, of inundation events across various areas of the scour and begin to develop an idea of how often these globally rare species are flooded. Heritage biologists across the network have had a long-standing interest in, the, in these river scour ecosystems. In order to get some of this information out into the research and conservation community, PNHP, along with the Southeastern Grasslands Initiative and the Natural Areas Association, are partnering to go and publish a special compendium of the Natural Areas Journal highlighting river scour research. If you'd like to hear more about this special compendium, please drop me a note or attend Lisa Smith's presentation on the Natural Areas Association later in this conference. Hi everyone, my name is Carla Church. I work with the Manitoba Conservation Data Center and I'm here to talk to you about one of my favorite things, which is tiger salamanders. The Eastern Tiger Salamander, or Ambosoma tigrinum, which is listed under the Canadian Species at Risk Act as endangered, and the Western Tiger Salamander, or Ambosoma mavortium, which is also listed under the Canadian Species at Risk Act as special concern, are closely related and similar in, in, in appearance. Uh, both were classified as a subspecies of A. tigrinum until 2008. In Canada, A. tigrinum's extant range is believed to be limited to the southeastern Manitoba border and extending up from the U.S., whereas the prairie population of Ambostoma mavortium ranges more broadly from the western border of the prairie ecozone in Alberta and east into Manitoba. While the Red River was thought to divide their ranges, the exact boundary, whether there's any overlap or whether hybridization between the species is occurring in southeastern Manitoba remains unclear. Distribution and abundance data for eastern tiger salamanders are sparse due to both the historical lack of surveys and the previous practice of classifying both eastern and western tiger salamander as the same species. At the time of the Kasiwak status report, there were only eight extant and one historical occurrence in Canada. Since 2013, the Manitoba Conservation Data Center has surveyed easily accessible human created and modified wetlands, identifying tiger salamander species based on morphologic characteristics, but also collecting tail tissue and egg samples between 2016 and 2020. Dr. Jim Bogart at the University of Guelph voluntarily analyzed a subset of the tissue collected using mitochondrial DNA and found some individuals previously visually identified as Ambostoma tigrinum had the mtDNA of Ambostoma mavortium. Eight records of previously identified tiger salamanders were confirmed to have the mtDNA of eastern tiger salamander, whereas seven records were found to have the mtDNA of western tiger salamander. The results introduced doubt of species accuracy for all previously visualized observed records and points the need to genetically confirm the observations. In an effort to understand the complexities of salamander genetics, the Canadian Wildlife Service and the Manitoba CDC 
uh, is working together to share our tiger salamander samples with the Schaefer, Schaefer Lab at UCLA. Dr. Brad Schaefer, distinguished professor at UCLA in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology, specializes in the conservation genetics of endangered amphibians and reptiles, and is considered the world's expert in tiger salamander genomics. His lab has mapped over 5,200 genes across the tiger salamander genome, making him uniquely qualified to analyze the tissue already collected by the MBCDC. The purpose of this project is to obtain more information on the distribution of the Sarah listed tiger salamander in southeastern Manitoba. This will, work will produce the only genetically confirmed occurrences of eastern tiger salamander in Canada and will aid in determining the Canadian distribution of eastern tiger salamander, clarifying the eastern boundary of western tiger salamander, and delineating the contact zone between the two species. The results will benefit the recovery planning for both species and will be incorporated into the upcoming recovery strategy for Eastern Tiger Salamander and the upcoming management plan for Western Tiger Salamander. For Eastern Tiger Salamander, the results will greatly contribute to the identification of critical habitat for both of these species. If you have any questions, this is my contact information. Feel free to reach out. Hi everyone, my name is Allie Cheney. I'm a biologist with the Nevada Division of Natural Heritage based in Carson City, Nevada. I wanted to give a brief update on a project Nevada Heritage has been working on recently to update our database on rare and at-risk butterflies. Nevada currently tracks 70 subspecies of butterflies across the state. Many of our butterfly records are historical and have last observation dates dating back to the 1980s and 90s and are based on specimen collections from butterfly researchers like George Austin. In order to update our database, we sought the help of local butterfly researchers from the University of Nevada to travel to areas where butterflies haven't been surveyed for many years to determine their presence and to assess area habitat conditions. We used biodiversity location data project money from NatureServe to fund an initial two-year butterfly survey effort. We tried to maximize our survey effort by focusing on four major drainages on the east side of the White Mountains in Esmeralda County, Nevada. All drainages were high quality montane habitats ranging from low elevation sagebrush steppe at 7,500 feet, leading into mixed pine and juniper forests with stands of mountain mahogany and wet meadows in the higher elevations, with Boundary Peak being the highest elevation site at above 10,000 feet. Wandering transects followed a typical pollard walk, counting abundance and diversity of adult butterflies in a six meter area surrounding the observer. Adults of our seven focal species were collected with the goal of collecting three females and three males from each drainage for each relevant species. Other species were collected for identification or as representatives of the region. Between the 2019 and 2020 field seasons, our survey crew recorded each of the seven focal butterfly species in at least one place in the region, including new observations of Hesperia miramae longivicola on Boundary Peak, likely the only location for this subspecies in Nevada. Our crew also observed one focal species, Limonitis lorquinae pallidafis, in the upper transect of Chatovich Creek which is a new record for this species in that drainage, as well as Euphilodes ancilla shields eye in Middle Creek and Plebigus sapiolus albamontanus in Indian Creek, new records for these drainages. There were differences between seasons, transects being much less diverse, having drier overall conditions, and species being generally more abundant earlier in the season than 2019, likely a result of poor winter conditions. In 2020, they did not observe Euphilodes ancilla shields eye at any location, and after two seasons, they did not observe Euphilodes ancilla shields eye or Polites sabuleti alba montana in Indian Creek. These are the only populations from historical records that were not observed across two seasons. Based on the White Mountains, Research Center's butterfly count, there are approximately 70 species found in the White Mountains and based on species host plants and ranges, there are roughly 61 species from that list likely to be found in this survey area. 
So in addition to verifying the presence of our seven focal tract species, the crew were also able to identify a total of 49 butterfly species in the region. These surveys, while only covering two seasons, have recorded presence of at-risk species and general habitat conditions that can be used to help update their state ranks. And we've been able to update last observation dates from as early as 1983 to 2020. We're excited to continue this project and are currently scheduled to begin butterfly surveys this summer for another two years and will be focusing on a different part of the state. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact me. Thanks so much. Good morning. My name is Kathleen Walls. I'm the ecologist with the New Jersey Natural Heritage Program here to report on some of the work we have done during the pandemic in 2020. 2020 was the 50th anniversary of the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection, and it was the 36th anniversary of the New Jersey Natural Heritage Program. The pandemic provided the program to, with a mandate to, to delve into social media and online communication for all work, including celebrations of these milestones. We are one of the smallest programs in the network with one data manager, one botanist, one ecologist, and two GIS special analysts. We su supplement our full-time staff with help from hourly employees who help with a lot of the rare plant surveys. So while New Jersey is a small state and essentially a peninsula between New York and Pennsylvania and Delaware, our state supports remarkable biodiversity with a native flora of 2,100 native taxa of which 842 or 40% are tracked. This really rivals larger states uh, that actually also have more staff. The floristic diversity is driven by geology and physiography from the renowned New Jersey pine barrens on the coastal plain to the glaciated karst landscape in the Ridge and Valley. Located within the Division of Parks and Forestry, the Heritage Program shares the biotics platform with the Division of Fish and Wildlife and their Endangered Non-Game Species Program. But the Heritage Program provides the data reporting services for all the taxa for rare plants, for animals, and ecological communities from biotics and ENSP's landscape mapping. So work during the pandemic was delayed uh, to mid-summer. And I'm having trouble advancing my screen. I apologize. Got it. Okay, so field work was delayed until midsummer, uh, and we were mandated to work in teams of two following COVID protocols, but we packed a lot of work into that truncated field season. I wanted to report on some botanical highlights. One of our hourly employees found three HS.1 species, Dicanthelium cryptanthum, Dicanthelium longilingulatum, and Anthropogon glomeratus variety hirsutior. Some other great vines were Camarum palustrum, uh, palustri, which was historic and now is back up to S1E, Sagnum strictum, which was re relocated in an Atlantic white cedar swamp in the Pine Barrens, and a new native species to the state, Atroplex glabriuscula, variety of glabriuscula, which was added to the flora. We also uh, located two new subpopulations of this uh, G1, G2, S1E <laughs> uh, species, uh, Boltonia montana, which was described by Johnny Townsend at the Virginia Natural Heritage Program, and it is found only in the Appalachian Mountain regions of Virginia and New Jersey. It glows in the, grows in this globally imperiled calcareous sinkhole pond community, and two new subpopulations were discovered. Um, and, and also the Hypericum magus was also discovered late in the season in the same habitat. These sites um, where the new discoveries were made are protected in designated natural areas within a state park and a wildlife management area. We also delved into new technology, <laughs> We were able to test Virginia Natural Heritage Program species distribution model for federally listed t &E species to identify potential new populations of the very difficult to survey uh, Ashenominy virginica in freshwater tidal marsh habitat via canoe. Um, we tested a drone fitted with a camera to look at true and false color imagery, and that was used to document the known populations. And the top right uh, image shows that the false color uh, imagery provided the best and most accurate and easy to find <laughs> imagery for that species. So the section six funded work uh, for these surveys at new sites identified in the species distribution model is ongoing and it's conducted by some of our very talented hourly employees. 
um, one of the last things I wanted to report on is an eco-regional floristic quality assessment for EPA Region 2, which is basically New Jersey and New York here. Um, there had been uh, eco-regional uh, floristic quality assessments developed for eco-regions in New England and the Mid-Atlantic and the Southeast, but there was a gap. And so we hired NatureServe um, to work with Don faber Dune and Mary Harkness and botanists from New Jersey, New York, and portions of Pennsylvania. We did go down that taxonomic synonymy rabbit hole and examined 5,598 taxa in eight ecoregions. Botanists in New Jersey included Jason Hafstead and myself, and we focused mainly on the taxa in the coastal plain. And a heritage botanist uh, Rich Ring from New York and Rachel Goad from Pennsylvania focused on taxa from the glaciated and unglaciated Allegheny Plateau. This exhaustive effort filled the EFQA gap between New England, Mid-Atlantic and Southeast, creating a seamless coverage from Maine to Georgia or just into Northern Florida. And it will be posted on the Universal FQA. So now using this EFQA and ecology plot data from state natural heritage programs, we can develop uh, reference condition standards and EORX for NBC wetland groups by ecoregion. So it's a very powerful tool. And lastly, um, we continue to meet via teams in our heritage program, but and learned a few new tricks. Um, but we were actually finally able to meet in person in the fall, which was really needed. And we met in late, I think in November to make sure we had a good, good chance to see each other in person before the long winter. So this year we are continuing to work from home and meet virtually, but we are actually out in the field already. So we are all looking forward to welcoming Sean when the Van Hubbelt tour arrives here in New Jersey. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. My name is Amy Jewett, and I am the Invasive Species Coordinator at the Pennsylvania Natural Heritage Program. And my talk today for the notes from the field is going to be a plug for a talk that I'm going to give uh, later today in the tools and tech. Uh, so this is a bit of a teaser for that talk. So uh, last year in 2020, uh, I gave or I, I hosted a special event uh, that I called the Invasive Species Scavenger Hunt. And this was a really cool event that I had never done before. And uh, I was really excited to see um, all the great things that came from it. And so I just wanted to kind of talk a little bit about what that scavenger hunt involved. And then hopefully if you have a chance, you can listen to my talk uh, later this afternoon. So the purpose of the scavenger hunt was, uh, it had actually multiple things that I was hoping to accomplish with it. Um, so in general, I think a lot of people, um, you know, that are consider themselves environmentalists probably know about invasive species already, and they're probably very familiar with certain common invasive species. So in this photo here, you can see um, a large uh, portion of the understory of this forest is being dominated by uh, garlic mustard, which is a very common invasive species here in Pennsylvania. Um, and so a lot of people are familiar with it and they're familiar with seeing it when they're out. But my goal with the scavenger hunt was to try to raise awareness of, for people of different species that are more high priority or even early detection species that may not be in Pennsylvania yet, but might be in other states and could come into Pennsylvania at some point. And so it was my goal to try to raise awareness uh, of these species and get people out and actually looking for them. Uh, and so that was uh, the, the beginning of the scavenger hunt. Um, again, I hosted it for the first time last year, and um, the way it worked is I selected um, a list of 15 species, and one of those species you can see here uh, in this picture is New Zealand mud snail, which is a very tiny aquatic snail. Um, it's a high priority species in our state uh, because it is fairly rare, and I really wanted to try again to you know, get more people to be looking for this and other species because it's one that I think a lot of people don't often see, again, for this example, because it is so small, but at least to get it on people's radar so that when they are in uh, the appropriate places or habitats for these species, that they can be out um, and know to look for them in case they might be there. 
And so uh, I put together a training and actually the, the, the story map that I'm sharing with you today was the training that I gave um, for folks last year. And so I talked about the who, what, when, where, and why of the scavenger hunt. And so um, my role with the heritage program in Pennsylvania is to administer the IMAP Invasives database. And so uh, all data went into the IMAP Invasives program, both uh, presence and absence that people um, were, were finding. They had the whole month of August to search for that information. Um, and then afterwards I did uh, wrap up and, and kind of provide um, uh, a summary of all the information that came through. And so here's just a quick look at the species list. Again, there was 15 total species, a variety of terrestrial and wetland plants, some aquatic species, and also uh, a few insects and other uh, aquatic invertebrates as well. Uh, and so again, I was very pleased to see the, the results of um, uh, the scavenger hunt, which I'll be talking about more in my talk uh, later this afternoon. And so if folks have any questions uh, about this, again, I would encourage you to listen to my talk um, and, and ask questions in the chat um, uh, later today. And that is pretty much all I have for my notes from the field talk today. So thank you. Hey everyone, I'm Gina Hill and I'm a research biologist at Florida Natural Areas Inventory, which is Florida's natural heritage program. I'll be talking to you today about the frosted elfin butterfly, Cochrane's iris and the conservation work we're currently doing. I'm going to cram a ton of information into a few minutes, so here we go. Just to give you some brief background information, the frosted elfin is a rare butterfly that's declining throughout many parts of its range in the eastern United States. NatureServe's rank for the frosted elfin is G2, G3, and you can see here that it's ranked as critically imperiled or imperiled across most of its range and extirpated from several areas. The frosted elephant occurs in small localized populations in sandhill habitat, pine oak barrens, and even along rights of way or power line cuts. It's closely tied to its host plants and is only found in areas where they grow. Um, this picture here is sundial lupin, which they feed on in Florida, but they will also feed on wild indigo in other parts of their range. U.S. Fish and Wildlife recently completed a species status assessment for the frosted elephant but they need more information on the population genetics across its range in order to have a better understanding of the overall genetic health of the species and to make a final decision about listing the species. So what this pro project actually looks like is us searching for tiny things while hunched over plants. Um, we're working with collaborators across the frosted elfin range to search for, for known populations of the butterfly and we're sending equipment to these collaborators so they can collect genetic material in a non-destructive way. And in order to do this, we're sampling spent egg cases or empty eggs because we found they actually retain a good amount of DNA. This is a great way to sample genetics without harming a population. And these eggs look like little donuts because they have a hole in the middle where the caterpillar is hatched out of. To show a comparison, unhatched eggs look green in color and don't have a hole in the middle. So we'll be targeting these uh, hatched little donut eggs as our target material. And once they are sampled and put into lysis buffer, our collaborators will ship them back to us here in Florida. Once we have all the samples in hand, we'll be using DNA barcoding to figure out how much genetic variation there is across all these small in often isolated populations, and also trying to figure out how it's ge geographically structured. Then we'll determine with fish and wildlife how to structure our management plans for the species. We'll also be collecting additional information about the habitats and associated populations across its range, which will also allow us to help support our rank for this tracked species. We've also made a project on iNaturalist to hopefully help us find new populations of its host plant and eventually new populations of the frosted elephant as well. So if you currently live within the frosted elephant's range, please keep your eyes peeled for its host plants. Again, that's sundial lupin and wild indigo. And please upload your observations to iNaturalist, which will go directly into this project. And one last fun anecdote, 
You'll see here that this butterfly is hanging out on a Q-tip, and that's because we actually made a beer for the frosted elfin and out of the frosted elfin to help raise awareness about the butterfly. So while partnering with the Florida Museum of Natural History and First Magnitude Brewing Company in Gainesville, Florida, we went out and collected the butterflies and swabbed them for their yeast and then released them. And we took the yeast back into the lab and cultured it and made it into a beer from this yeast. And so while this might, may sound gross, I promise it was delicious. Um, the end result was this wonderful New England style IPA. And the cans and labels were fun and also had some educational facts on them. So hopefully we'll be brewing more of this beer next spring during this next flight season. Um, and with that, I'll leave it there. Thanks to everyone for your time. And please feel free to contact me if you have any questions at all. Hi, this is Johnny Townsend from the Virginia Natural Heritage Program. Glad to be here and uh, talk a little bit first about a uh, genus I'm pretty into and had some major discoveries recently is the genus Dicanthelium, which grasses uh, related to Panicum. Um, been looking at them for a long time and, and finally back in 2013 came across a couple that just didn't make any sense. Um, these were ones, uh, for instance, the one on the left, I can feel them Appalachiense, which we now have a name for, is found in these, these uh, slight grassy openings in the mountains like the, the picture in the center in our shale region. Um, the one on the right, uh, now named Dicanthelium harvillii, is one that we discovered subsequently at one of our preserves on um, a greenstone geology. Again, something that just didn't make any sense. Um, for years, I've been working with Richard LeBlond, uh, formerly North Carolina Heritage Program, uh, now retired but still very active. Um, we sort of messed with these for a number of years and finally just couldn't find anything else to do with them, but uh, published these as new names in the Journal of the Botanical Research Institute of Texas, which just came out in December. Um, apparently both quite rare. Um, they are grasses and, and hard to understand the genus, so you know who knows exactly how much there is. But so far, Appalachiense, known from a handful of populations in Virginia and one historic one in Pennsylvania, with Harvillii only known from the one site. Similar spots in North Carolina have been searched with no luck yet, but we have not really done an exhaustive search. So. Anyway, there and related, um, Difficult Creek Natural Area Preserve. Um, this is a property that we own and manage in the southern Piedmont of Virginia in um, an area that people refer to sometimes as having Piedmont prairies or at least woodlands, spots that had uh, fairly open woods or, or um, even grasslands that are more open than that with a diverse herb layer. Um, high diversity of species, a lot of management needed to keep it open and maintained. Um, the sampling you see us doing at the left um, ended up quantifying this a little bit better than we had been able to do before, uh, coming up with around about 95 to 100 species per 100 square meters and upwards of 40 species per square meter, which tops um, out some of the lists of diversity of, uh, that we found in plots in Virginia to date. So pretty darn diverse place. A lot of it is due to management. Um, this is supposedly what we think is a natural fire regime in the area, so I wouldn't call it unnatural at all, but we are reintroducing fire there, removing loblolly pine, which was planted, guiding it back toward dominance by hardwoods and uh, shortleaf pine. Endemic species in the area, Marshallia lagrandii, known only from this site in Virginia, and then the one where it was first described in North Carolina a couple other historic sites, but that's it. And then Dicanthelium barvillii, which I mentioned in the previous uh, previous slide. So for this place, the intensive management um, has really brought the flora back to life, uh, where it had been shaded and, and sort of moribund before. And with more management and fire, like at the right, um, we're getting more and more species all the time on the preserve, more to come. Uh, and that's what I have. Thanks. Michigan has so many natural areas that connect us all. 
A few miles from the captivating Lake Michigan shoreline, we can find some unique and wild forest along the Muskegon River. It is here that we have an open invitation to explore the Muskegon State Game Area. This natural treasure holds secret grasslands reminiscent of the prairies of our heartland. These prairie remnants are some of the rarest natural communities in the state. And though a lot has changed in the past 200 years, the surrounding forests are some of the region's most extensive. And the river. The Muskegon River is our gateway to the north. Its watershed is one of the largest in the state. The river is cradled by extensive lowland forests, and it is home to an abundance of wildlife. The river feeds Muskegon Lake before it empties into Lake Michigan, and here the iconic coastline is enjoyed by over a million visitors every year. This is a natural playground that is a part of our shared identity. But to continue to enjoy these places, we need the water at their edges to remain clean. And that is why the Muskegon State Game Area is so important. The sprawling forests keep our river safe. They protect our waters. They mitigate floods. They absorb runoff from agriculture. These forests protect the game fish that are intertwined with our local economy. This special place is so close to the city of Muskegon but remains relatively unknown. But this place really matters. These lands exist because of hunters, and they benefit all of us. They are ours to enjoy and to protect. Come explore what you have to discover. Hello, BWB 2021. I'm Max Henschel, ecologist with the New York Natural Heritage Program. Old growth forests have long held a certain mystique with both the public and scientists alike. These forests once covered over 950 million acres in the eastern U.S., about 62 million of which were in the northeast. Today, these forests cover less than one half of one percent of the east. The northeast fared slightly better with about two-thirds of one percent remaining, or about 450,000 acres. New York has an estimated 400,000 acres of old growth remaining. There's old growth in all regions of the state, but most is concentrated in the forest preserves in the Adirondack and Catskill Mountains. Barbara McMartin compiled state land acquisitions and logging records to estimate that there are about 300,000 acres of old growth remaining in the Adirondacks. The Catskills contain about 70,000 more acres and the balance is spread throughout the rest of the state. We were asked by the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation to develop a method for their staff to quickly and tentatively identify old growth in the field. So we decided that the ogre was the best way to handle this, but not that ogre. The old growth rapid evaluation consists of three sections that can be readily collected in the field using the ESRI Survey123 app on mobile devices. The characteristics that we look for include emergent trees, trees with a twisted trunk, emergent trees that are have relatively straight trunks and very few upper branches, and trees with a buttressed stump. We also classify the coarse woody debris in the area by size class and decay class. And finally, we look for three old growth indicator bryophytes, Necura pinata, Perella platyphylla, and Lobaria pulmonaria. The data collected syncs with ArcGIS Online and can be viewed in ArcGIS here in ArcGIS Pro. We found this to be a very useful method for identifying old growth, which we can then follow up later with more in-depth field surveys to confirm our old growth areas. Thanks for the opportunity to share our ogre with you and look forward to talking old growth with anyone interested. In the Northwest Territories, several large protected areas have recently been established to protect the natural and cultural diversity of the region. To support the management of these areas, government and university scientists are partnering with indigenous guardians and communities developing a biodiversity monitoring program. 
in Tsute, Nelene, Tuye, a territorial protected area near Fort Good Hope in the Northwest Territories, the Gashokotene, Government of the Northwest Territories, Canadian Wildlife Service, and the University of British Columbia have been piloting this program. Mm -hmm. Traveling through waist deep snow in the midst of winter, the scientists and guardians have deployed hundreds of trail cameras and recording units throughout the protected area. Once set up, the units are left out for a year to capture the movement and sounds of wildlife. The data collected will establish a baseline for wildlife populations across the region, providing information on what the full community looks like what the species are doing, what condition they are in, and other seasonal patterns. Beyond information about wildlife, cameras also allow for insight into snow and vegetation patterns. Together, this information will help the researchers, guardians, and community members understand changes in the environment brought on by human use and climate change. In turn, supporting the work of Indigenous communities in managing these protected areas in the future. Hi everyone, I'm Jessica Smith. I'm the Assistant Botany Team Lead for the Colorado Natural Heritage Program, and I'm pleased to deliver this note from the field to you. This short video will provide an overview of the work CNHP is doing using unmanned aerial systems, aka drones, for rare plant surveying and monitoring. I want to thank my co-creators of this video, Neil Swayze and Jill Handwork, who have done the field work for this project. We hope you enjoy it. One of the challenges we face in tracking biodiversity in Colorado is that in some cases, our rare plants can be found on inaccessible habitat. And this is the case with the parachute pinstemon, pinstemon devilus. This is a species which is federally listed as threatened under the Endangered Species Act and considered globally critically imperiled. This species is a perennial plant found in Western Colorado on the Rhone Plateau above the towns of Parachute and Rifle. I'd like to introduce you to drone technology. Drones can fly for 15 to 25 minutes and capture video or fine resolution images. Photos are geo-referenced giving precise location. The methods used by CNHP have been developed by Neil Swayze, who you can see here flying the drone. The first thing Jill and Neil would do in the field is identify the study area. This species grows on a specific substrate, the Parachute Creek member of the Green River Formation. Next, Neil would capture images with the drone. In 2020, Neil flew 80 flights covering 596 acres and captured over 40,000 images. Back in the office, Neil would process the images with a program called Agisoft Metashape resulting in 7.5 terabytes of orthomosaics. The orthomosaics have ultra-fine resolutions, ranging from 1 millimeter to 5 millimeters per pixel. 3D models like this one were also generated. Next, with the help of student interns and QGIS, the orthomosaics were visually searched using a 1 meter by 1 meter fishnet, checking each cell for occurrences. Only flowering plants were used to confirm ID 
And in this way, population extent was summarized, but abundance was not calculated. This is an image captured by the drone with plants marked by a green dot. The second photo here shows the detail of a flowering plant captured by the drone. So here are some results from the drone surveying in 2020. 12 new suitable habitat locations were surveyed. 936 flowering penstemon devils were identified. 12.16 acres of close range orthomosaics were inspected, which took, took approximately 224 hours. And this is an average of around 219 square meters of orthomosaics per hour. In addition to surveying, this project also included a component to fly the drone over a monitoring plot, which CNHP has been sam sampling annually since 2015 with terrestrial photo monitoring. Using the drone, two different flying altitudes and two different cameras were used to test the detectability of plants. Initial results from the lowest flight altitude look promising, with one benefit being that plants identified from images can be geo-referenced. Upcoming work with the drone includes continuing to refine monitoring methods, testing the possibility of automated detection with multispectral classification, and looking for new populations in unsurveyed habitat. I'd like to thank some of our key supporters, Dr. Wade Tinkham and the Forest Biometrics Lab at CSU, partner organizations, Arid Lands and Ecology GIS, our funders, the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, and the Colorado Natural Areas Program and access provided by private landowners. If you have any further questions, you can contact me, Neil, or Jill at the email addresses listed here. Thank you very much. 2020 was an exciting year at the Indiana Natural Heritage Program. Even though there was a pandemic, the outdoors weren't closed. Longtime heritage ecologist Roger Hedge retires at the end of April 2021, so this was his last full field season with the program. In contrast, this was the first full field season for our new heritage botanist, Scott Namasnik. To ensure that Roger could pass along the years of accumulated knowledge of Indiana's flora and high-quality natural communities, the two of them embarked on a whirlwind tour of the state. Approximately 100 field days, 339 plant EOs, and 53 community EOs, including a new, new G2 coastal plain marsh later, Scott has a solid base to share with a new ecologist later in the year. Keep your eyes open for that network job announcement. During their adventures, they were able to make quite a few new finds to supplement what is known about Indiana's rare flora, including several plant species that were records new to the state of Indiana. For example, Eriophorum tenellum is a species that occurs in bogs and was previously known from just north of the state. This year, the pair identified the sedge in a bog in LaPorte County, which is located in the northern tier of counties in Indiana and generally within the species' native range. This sedge is comparable to Eriophorum gracilli, which grows in similar habitats, making it likely that Eriophorum tenellum has been naturally occurring within Indiana, but attributed to the sister species. The distinction was made between the two species, leading to a new state record for the few nerved cotton grass. Known from limestone glades and barrens to the south and west of Indiana, Scott and Roger recorded Echinacea simulata for the first time in Indiana. This coneflower species was previously lumped taxonomically with Echinacea pallida and was not on the radar as a species within the state. However, a, after a tip from our former heritage botanist, the wavy leaf purple coneflower was officially identified at a site in Harrison County. Iliochorus atropurpurea is a small and inconspicuous spike rush with a scattered distribution throughout the country. This species prefers open, wet sand habitats and flowers and fruits early in the year, in contrast to many other species in the genus. Due to these characteristics, it is likely that this species had also been overlooked. Nevertheless, a state record was discovered in Porter County by a partner organization and identified again by a heritage staff in adjacent Lake County. A heritage team also had discoveries of new populations of species not seen in some time. Carex cordoriza is a bog species previously only known in Indiana from three sites in as many counties. In two of these counties, the creeping sedge occurrences are historical, so the new population identified in Kosciuszko County in 2020 will be the first time the species has been observed in Indiana since 1989. Similarly, Scott and Roger observed a new population of Persicaria cetacea in Jefferson County, yet another county record. This smartweed, previously known from only two counties, has not been recently observed 
with only a potential sighting in 2014, which has not been relocated since. The new found populations of both of these species have the potential to be the only extant occurrences currently within the state. Last observed in 1945 in Stark County, Colatania longifolia, subspecies longifolia, was considered extirpated from Indiana until last year's field work yielded a new record of the species from one county south in Pulaski County. This finding of the coastal plain disjunct species was yet another exciting find as we were able to remove the extirpated qualifier for the species. Overall, it was a busy but productive 2020 field season, packed full of new discoveries, and we're looking forward to seeing what 2021 might bring. Wow. I don't know about you, but I was blown away by those ta talks. Fantastic. What great work is going on all over the network. Thanks very, very much to the speakers. Wonderful, every single one. And thanks too for the audience. The, uh, the peanut gallery, AKA chat window was pretty active with some really great comments. That was fun. Okay, that's a wrap on this year's Notes from the Field session. Thanks for attending. Thanks again to the presenters. And now it's on to the lunch roundtables at BWB. Thanks. <laughs>